Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Spokane City Council briefing session of August 15th. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council President Beggs. Here. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Council Member Sapone. Here. Let the record reflect that Council Member Kinnear is absent. All right. We're, before we get to briefing, we are going to start with a brief interview with uh, Brianna Gorder, who's uh, been nominated by the mayor to serve on the CHHS board. Brianna, if you want to just come down to this podium here. Got to see you a week or so ago. Uh, yeah. Good. So if you could just tell us um, why you're interested in serving on the board and what you think you'll bring to it. Um, so I applied for the board, I think, back in May, and I was really interested in understanding the moving parts of kind of where funding goes. I think quite often uh, I'm a service provider, homeless services. Um, me personally, I don't understand the financial piece to it, so I wanted to know the moving parts, but also bring my lived experience to the table. Um, I come back from three generations of welfare and poverty incarceration, um, so I wanted to be able to kind of be the advocacy piece of uh, the CHHS board for people with lived experience, this thing's like poking my face, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great, and can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you got to Spokane? Um, I grew up in the Valley. I was born at Deaconess. Um, I did some stretches in Seattle, Portland. I went to high school in Oregon, but ultimately came back to Spokane in high school. Um, so I've been a Spokane resident somewhere in this county mm -hmm. for pretty much all of my life. Right. And we always ask, where, what high school did you attend here? Um, I went to an East Valley contract mm -hmm. school, um, so online. Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll open it up to any other questions. You said you yeah. were a uh, provider in which area? Housing? Um, yeah. So I'm a housing specialist at Revive. Oh, great. great. Yeah. Welcome. So my question is, thank you so much for being here. Yes. Um, as you, with your background, and um, as you're out in the community and you see what's happening with more and more homeless and less shelter space, less housing, what is that, um, what is your thoughts on, if you, could, if you could snap your fingers and have one thing to help fix it, what would it be? One thing? <laughs> Just one <laughs> big thing. Um, <clears throat> Well, it's kind of a it's a it's a complex problem without yeah. a one size fits all solution. Um, I think that we're making headway in the process with the trench shelter, the commerce dollars, uh, low income housing um, options. But really, it seems like rent control would be a huge piece to prevent homelessness right now. Right. Um, and then just the <laughs> mitigation piece with folks meeting them where they are, getting them connected to services. I, I mean. It, even as a housing navigator, it is extremely confusing um, what services, what people qualify for. If you have a green shirt, go here. If you have a red shirt, go here. So really see a reduction in the bottleneck that we have in the services in the county because a lot of them don't get utilized because folks don't know where to go. Right. Thank you for that. And I, uh, the last time I was at Camp Hope, I was astounded by the... Um, numbers of people I ran into that were homeless because they had been priced out of their apartments. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for applying thank and all you. the work that you do. We'll have a vote uh, on your nomination. You don't need to be here and we'll let you know that you are officially, although unpaid, a member of the uh, <laughs> CHHS board and we really look forward to your service and perspective and advocacy. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. All right. Mr. Perkins, we can go to the August 22nd agenda. Thank you, Council President. Good afternoon, Council President Beggs, members of the City Council. This is the advance briefing for Monday, August 22nd. First up on the consent agenda are items one and two. Item one is a public works agreement with Pro Mechanical Services for HVAC replacement at Fire Station 17. Item two is a contract with Environment Control of Spokane for janitorial services at various fire stations. Our briefer is Deputy Fire Chief Jay Atwood. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Good afternoon, Council President and Council. Uh, first item for consideration is the HVAC replacement uh, for the system at Fire Station 17, which serves the Indian Trail neighborhood. That station is the last of our prototypical stations that need to have the um, 
replacement of the HVAC system. The low bid for the project came in at $62,144 through Pro Mechanical Services. That was without tax. We're asking the council to approve a total of 74, up to a total of $74,500 for this. That gives us the room to be able to, to account for the uh, state sales tax and create a little bit of a reserve in case we see some fluctuation in the cost of the uh, equipment itself. That's been something we've encountered with various other projects as of late. Uh, second item for consideration is a contract with Environmental Control Services. And sorry, I'm trying to get to the numbers here. <clears throat> uh, that is that company provides the janitorial work for various facilities for the fire department, primarily all of the facilities at our training campus. That includes the training building, combined communications, the field house, uh, and the other buildings on that complex and then that also includes the fire administration building that contract is um, set to run from july 1st of 2022 through june 30th of 2025 for the baseline contract and this also includes a two-year uh, up to two years additional renewal based on that uh, pricing structure the total cost is sixty four thousand twenty seven dollars and that does include the sales tax Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Item three, grant funds from the Department of Justice's Office on Violence Against Women Firearms Technical Assistant Project. Our presenter from the Police Department is Major Mike McNabb. Good afternoon, Council President, City Council. I am briefing this for Jennifer Hammond, who's off this week. We are collaborating with the Spokane Regional Domestic Violence Coalition uh, to receive grant funding for, from the Office of Violence Against Women to extend or continue our firearms technical assistance project pilot program. And within that program, we will have a uh, coordinator and we will also have specialized training for officers on DV, domestic violence protection orders, and firearms training, and then also there will be overtime created for officers who want to go do specialized enforcement for serving orders and um, recovering firearms from those who are restricted from having firearms. If that money's not used, then they will use uh, some of those funds for uh, culturally specific training and technical assistance in community assessment. Total grant award is $499,833. Thank you, Major. I apologize to Ms. McConnell and Major McNabb. I was thinking number three and I read number four. Now we'll go back to number three, which is grant funds, grant funds from the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission as part of their dynamic, diverse, community-oriented police force recruitment and retention. Our presenter from the police department is Jackie McConnell. Good afternoon, Council. So I put in for some funds from the Criminal Justice Training Commission and we were granted 54,450. Um, so this would be for a year period of time from the time that they um, said the grant went into effect, which I believe was about a month ago. And so this would just be for us to uh, be able to use some money to, for recruitment efforts, uh, probably primarily for travel. Some will be for um, some social media stuff as well but maybe primarily for travel, possibly to other states, probably mostly within the state, going to different public safety testing site locations with some recruiters. So just asking if uh, we can just accept those funds. So I have a question, Jackie. So if I remember at the testing, when they were, where were they tests? Those tests can be used for any recruitment at other police departments or that is not true. So. Yes, so when somebody takes a public safety test, they can show up and they can basically check a box for a variety of police departments. Okay. There are some police departments, not all, that will show up to the public safety tests and they're allowed to essentially set up a table and recruit. Uh, we've actually found quite a bit of success from that. So for example, maybe um, like if there was a testing that happened and we showed up maybe originally, and, and I'm just throwing numbers out mm -hmm. there, don't quote me on these numbers, like say originally 10 people signed up for the Spokane Police Department 
And then as our recruiters address people that come in, maybe an additional 10 have checked the box. So we have seen quite a bit of success by going to the PST test. So I don't know if you remember, but we had received a $60,000 grant from the Criminal Justice mm -hmm. Training Commission. That was for a, that was for a six-month period. Um, they had intended for it to be for a year. It ended up being only for six months. And so we learned some things with that money and kind of where we saw the most bang for our buck, so to speak. And we really think basically going to military-type events and then going to the public safety testing mm -hmm. sites have been our best recruitment efforts. Thank you, Ms. McConnell. Item five, memorandum of understanding with Spokane County to apply for fiscal year 2022 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant. Our presenter is Assistant Police Chief Justin Lundgren. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, Council. Uh, the item before you for consideration is the joint application for the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant or JEG Grant 2022 program. Each year we apply with the Spokane County Sheriff's Office and we alternate who will be the fiscal agent. This year the, the county will be uh, handling the application on our behalf. Uh, the money that the city will be allocated is $81,396 to be used for uh, safety equipment. Are there any questions? Thank, Thank you, you, Chief Lundgren. To finish up the consent agenda, item six, report of the mayor on pending claims and payments the Parks and Library and the respective boards and warrants. The, that information will be completed in time for the Monday, August 22nd Council consideration and item seven, the City Council meeting met, minutes that also will be completed for Council's consideration on Monday, August 22nd. Moving then to the special budget ordinances. The first ordinance up deals with the public safety and judicial grant fund and this action arises out of the need to update training facilities and equipment and continuing on the theme of the police department, Jackie McConnell. And, and we've already briefed this a few times, but my yes. question- so I, I was gonna say, I'm not sure what yeah, to yeah. say. <laughs> my, um, when Major Olson was here last time, we deferred this, he was going to check to see if we could um, allocate uh, regular time training funds to this grant. And I don't know if he's done that yet, but that's what we were pending, waiting to hear oh, because okay. there was a lot of training where we paid officers to attend training for the legislative updates. And we were given our whole in the, um, payroll for this year for police. We thought we could take some of this grant money and do that. So he was gonna check see legally if we could do that, but I don't know if you will know that. So I checked with finance. So I checked with Kevin Schmidt, um, who is our finance guy, and he checked with somebody else, you know, on, on over here. And so there was actually a little guidance given on how this money could be spent when we originally received it. So the answer isn't necessarily no, we can't do that. There are some complications though, just like we can't pull up the information for Intel staff for our training in 2020, 2021. And the other aspect is whether or not we would have received these funds, we would have done that training because we have three in services a year where we, we train. So whether or not we received these funds, we would have done the training regardless, whether it was reform training or in previous years, other training having to do with other updates because there are always updates to, to laws and the way that police officers um, you know, go about their jobs. So um, the answer is it, it could be possible um, could we do it? Uh, maybe there might be some, uh, they think there'd be some difficulties kind of in trying to figure out exactly how to track those funds. So, um, let's see, I don't know if, if that's a definitive answer for you, but. Well, it sounds like we could do a special budget ordinance to allocate the rest of those funds to that that would help us in our budget crunch, since it sounds like it's permissible, it's just not a requirement to do that. We, I mean, we can do some homework. There will be, uh, it was $131,666. If, if what I asked for is approved, there would be $131,666 still remaining in this, um, in these funds. So, I mean, those could be put towards something like that, you know, towards maybe, or reimbursing maybe some overtime. 
Maybe we could go back and try to find some of the overtime that we had to use uh, in, in going to some of the meetings or putting together some of the training or something like that. Okay. Anyway, that answers the question that I had. So thank okay. You. Was there anything else on that since I'm up here? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Hold, hold on. I hold. think you have one more special one. budget ordinance regarding uh, newly awarded grant funds to be used to increase the department's hiring and recruiting activities. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the one that I just briefed. So that would just be to um, basically increase the revenue to accept the funds from the Criminal Justice Training Commission. Thank and you. No questions? And that's kind of the same for the next one, mm -hmm. Mr. Perkins. You yes, already, it is. Major McNabb already told us about it. He has. And. I think he'd probably address these other special budget ordinance as well, the grant funds to procure ALPR equipment. I think he's briefed on both of yep. those. Okay. Right. With that, Council President Beggs, we move to emergency ordinances. The first one is the process and criteria for citing essential city facilities. And we've already briefed this too. We have. And the last one, uh, emergency ordinance, the con process for the, uh, the conduct of collecting collective bargaining and we briefed that as well we have all right with that we will go to a hearing and our presenter is Eldon Brown this is a hearing on vacation of portions of Boy Scout Way and Gardner Avenue and that's H1A H1B is the first reading ordinance vacating portions of Boy Scout Way and Gardner Avenue Mr. Brown Good afternoon. We have a hearing set for next Monday for the vacation, and I'll see if I can bring that up a little better. It's basically for two pieces of right of way. One's on Gardner Avenue, just east of Howard Street. The other piece is on Boy Scout Way, which is west of Weston, and we're talking about two little pieces of right-of-way out there as part of the stadium project. That vacation area you can see there on Boy Scout Way is 43 feet. On that one, excuse me, that's 25. I'll bring up another map in a minute to maybe show a little clearer. We're talking about 43 feet on Gardner Avenue, the east 43 feet. The rest of that right away on Gardner will stay there. And we did actually vacate everything in the middle of Boy Scout Way and Gardner previously, except for this 43 feet and the 25 feet. I'll see if I can pull up one more map that shows it a little better here. So we do have Howard Street on the west side here. This is the 43 feet of Gardner Avenue that we're trying to vacate. Everything in the middle of the, of kind of the lilac there is already been vacated. So we're just looking for these two pieces. We used to have sewer and water in the middle of this thing that has been relocated. So we won't have any utilities in those two pieces to be vacated. The actual cost of that right away was about $47,000. I think the council may have received a a letter from the PFD a couple of weeks ago requesting relief of that paying that fee for the benefit of the project on there. We did have that as a condition to originally require that the uh, cost of the vacation was $47,104. They're asking for relief based on the public benefit of the project. We did previously accommodate that on Cataldo. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask, are, are there previous examples where we've waived the fees for yes. individuals or organizations? Typically, if they can really show the public benefit of a project on there that outweighs the, the actual cost of that right away, we would entertain that type of request, but the council kind of has to approve it. So right now, we did have that request in there. We did show in the council condition, or the report conditions for this vacation that they pay that fee, but we would recommend waiving the fee based on the letter we received. But when we have the hearing next Monday, that would be a council decision. And, 
Is, is the applicant specifically the facilities district or is it the school district? Both. I mean, public facilities district actually submitted uh, the application, but the school district was certainly supporting it in the letter. Sure. Okay. So is there any, we would recommend approval of this vacation subject to conditions other than amending the one that requires the payment of the, for the right of way. We would recommend actual waiving of that based on their letter of justification. Is there any other questions on this? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Council President, that concludes the advanced briefing agenda, I believe, for Monday, August 22nd. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? <clears throat> Any abstentions? All right, August 22nd agenda is approved. That brings us to the August 15th agenda. Oh, very good. Advanced briefing for Monday, August 15th. Consent agenda items one and two. Item one, low bid of Inland Asphalt Company for the Illinois Avenue grind and overlay project. Item two, administrative reserve increase to the contract with La Vriere Incorporated for the Havana Well Station. Our presenter is Dan Buller. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Item one is to propose a low bid contract with Inland Asphalt Company of Spokane Valley for the Illinois Grand and Overlay Project in the amount of $2.327 million, to which we propose to set aside a 10% administrative reserve. This project grinds and overlays Illinois from Perry to Market Street, as well as reconfigures the lanes to relocate both bike lanes to the south side of the street, the bluff side, and a shared use path separated from traffic by a three-foot concrete island. Inland Asphalt's bid was the only bid received and was approximately 160,000 or about 6% below the engineer's estimate. While it's possible this project will be constructed this year, it's more likely that it'll be a 23 project. And item two is to propose administrative reserve increase for the Havana Dan, Wells. can you speak just a little more into the mic yeah, for I, I, people at home? Thanks. Um, item two is the proposed administrative reserve increase for the Havana Well Station project in the amount of $250,000. This increase is necessitated by some design changes to fit within the requirements imposed by a VISTA. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Buller. <clears throat> Item three, consultant agreement with Matrix Consulting Group. Our presenter from Fleet Division is Adam Russell. Good afternoon, Council. On May 2nd, Council passed an ordinance which appropriated ARPA funding to procure police vehicle cost usage study. An RFP was drafted and submitted, resulting in two responses. A selection committee comprised of reps from Fleet Police, Purchasing, and City Council evaluated and scored the proposal unanimously, selecting Matrix Consulting to be awarded the contract. Fleet Services is seeking contract approval with Matrix Consulting in the amount of $61,000. $100, not including applicable sales tax for completion of the police cost and usage study analysis. Can I answer any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Item four, a recommendation to list the Breslin 729 South Bernard Street on the Spokane Registry of Historic Places. Our presenter, who I believe is online, is Megan Duvall. I am. Good afternoon, Council. I will share my screen here. Okay, great. I will run through these slides really quickly. Um, local program, as you know, Spokane Register of Historic Places. This is a voluntary listing. Uh, we do require the consent of the owner before we list anything. And the protection of the historic resource is through the management agreement that you are reviewing. Design review is only when a building permit is sought for the exterior of the building. And this is how we offer incentives to property owners. In order to be eligible, a uh, property generally has to be 50 years of age or older, and it has to meet criteria that we have set out in the municipal code. We can list buildings, sites, district structures, and objects. Category A is related properties that are related to broad patterns of Spokane's history. Category B is an association with a significant or important person in Spokane's past. Category C is based on its architecture. Category D is uh, 
site that's important um, to prehistory or history. And then uh, category E is our cultural heritage. So the Breslin Apartments uh, is what we're looking at today, just one nomination for you. Built in 1911, the architecturally significant Breslin Apartments at 729 South Bernard Street is a well-preserved early 20th century apartment building. The Breslin is six stories tall with an L-shaped plan and a flat roof with a short parapet above a narrow molded uh, cornice. The Breslin is located just to the northeast of the Mary Cliff Cliff Park Historic District, which was listed on the National Register in 1978 and the Edwidge Woldson Park, uh, all within the Cliff Cannon neighborhood. The Breslin Apartments meets Spokane Register of Historic Places under Category A as a property that's associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of the history of the city of Spokane. Breslin is significant under Category A as a part of the history as a part of the wave of in-city multiple family dwellings that were being developed at this time which changed how Spokaneites lived in the city. It's also significant under category C as a good example of a type, the type being a new apartment building, and as the work of master architect Albert Held. Breslin apartment building was one of a handful of purpose-built apartment buildings constructed in the early 20th century to house middle and upper class residents. This housing option was not available earlier when Spokane residents typically resided in single-family housing or boarding houses. These new apartment buildings were designed to provide an attractive alternative for in-city living. The Breslin features neoclassical detailing conveyed by its classical portico and other terracotta detailing, but it also has a connection to the arts and crafts movement through the use of decorative tile in the entry. The interior design of the apartments includes layouts where the public and private areas within the apartments are separated by corridors. The public areas for the apartments as a whole are also well detailed. While the public entry area for the Breslin is not large, it is articulated with, wood, with dark stained decorative wood balusters that display its roots in the arts and crafts era, box beams, wood trim, and beadboard wainscoting. The Breslin's architect, Albert Held, was known for perfecting the apartment building as a type, but also for his prolific output in artistry and many other building types and styles. The Breslin's already listed on the National Register of Historic Places as part of the apartment buildings by Albert Held Thematic Group, which was listed in 1986. The Breslin Apartments retains excellent integrity and original location, design, workmanship, and association. It was reviewed by the Spokane Historic Landmarks Commission at the July 20th meeting and is recommended for listing on the Spokane Register. Hey, Megan, it's Karen. Hi, Karen. I just wanted to let you know you had me at Mary Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. See, it's that high school thing. That's yeah, right. The Mary Cliff Cliff kind of got excited District. Up here. That's right. Thank you. My mother was also a Mary Cliff grad, so go Mary she Cliff. She gets it. <laughs> yep. Well, it is right behind LC, so. I, that's right. That is true, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Sure. Item five is a contract extension with the House of Charity to provide financial support for the continuation of socially distanced shelter beds. The presenter is Jen Saracides, but I believe she is out today, so I'm not sure. George Dahl, are you I, presenting? Or, or she, you're there. I, I am actually on the phone. Okay. Jen Saracides, go ahead, Jen. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for, um, for having me here today. Uh, so this is actually an item that we already took through council, and as we were going through the contract, we realized there was an error in the total amount of grant funds given over a period of time. Um, the amount that uh, council previously approved is still the same. There was just an error in the, the total volume of dollars over uh, the length of the contract, and we've made that adjustment. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, so I, I guess my question is, <clears throat> The, um, 
the uh, dollars that we're spending are going towards, it says 35 socially distanced shelter beds. So <clears throat> now that we're not doing social distancing anymore, I guess I'm wondering, are we gonna see an additional number of beds? <clears throat> Excuse me, an additional number of beds that would be provided uh, as part of this? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, no, it would remain at 35 beds. Since this is a contract extension, um, it will utilize the same language from the original contract, which was provided by COVID dollars. Um, so they will retain those additional 35 beds for the six months going from July 1st to December 31st um, for that time period. Um, they, they won't necessarily be required to be socially distanced if that's no longer a requirement by the health district, um, but it would allow Catholic Charities and House of Charity to have an additional 35 beds above and beyond their normal um, bed allotment. Well, I, I guess just to follow up, I mean, I, what I'm wondering is we're spending $10,000 a bed. There's no services as part of this is my understanding. So I, I would just assume that if we're not social distancing, we're going to get a better bang for the buck. We'll be able to accommodate additional individuals. And so I, I, I'm a little confused as to why it would just remain at 35, given that we're no longer doing social distancing. So, um, so there are social services that come along with staying at um, House of Charity, even in one of these beds. Um, and in working with uh, House of Charity, this is kind of their, their standard for, um, for these additional beds, the, the cost. It's actually a little bit cheaper um, than it, what it had been. It, it went down a little bit, but, um, but that's their standard cost uh, for those, those additional beds. Thanks. Okay. And Jen, I don't know if you were watching at um, committee, but it looks like this is about $1,300 a bed per month, which is way less than yep. uh, the Trent shelter operator, it looked like. But do you have any, any ideas why they can do it so much cheaper? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, I would be speaking out of school um, with my hypothesis on that, but um, you know, each agency has um, a different cost structure and you know, being that they are a more established agency with um, uh, more private dollars, they may be able to supplement um, their funds with, uh, with private donations um, versus Guardians, who is a newer organization, may not have that base. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Item six, accept grant funding to perform a storm water study per the Washington State Department of Ecology. The presenter is Trey George. Good afternoon, Council. I'm here to request on item number six, uh, consent to accept an, an ecology grant for $300,000 that requires a 25% match to perform a TAPE study. TAPE is an emergent technology study. It's a program ecology offers. Um, the study we would like to perform in cooperation with the county and, and the valley is a, a, a non-vegetated swale study. And what that means is that it would put another tool in our toolkit when we build these swales that are required for stormwater treatment, but we wouldn't have to irrigate them, which matches the city's water conservation goals. Any questions I can answer? Yeah, just what's the cost differential between the new type of swale and the swales that we're using now? It's a, it's a good question, and I don't have that, that answer in the back of my pocket, but we wouldn't have to pay for the vegetation or the landscaping expertise, and so... Um, it, it would be a reduction, in other words? It would be a reduction, correct. Okay. Thank you. Can you tell us a little more of the mechanics of how it accomplishes its goal without the vegetation? Well, that's, that's a great question. That is in my wheelhouse. Um, okay. It's the bioretention the bio soil media is where the magic happens in a stormwater swale. That's the soil. It's an engineered soil we put underneath the, the swale that w forces water to go through that, that media, and that's what removes the pollutants from stormwater. Mm -hmm. So um, the column studies that were done to, uh, that Ecology used to approve the current vegetated swale uh, showed that they probably would work uh, without the vegetation, and that's what we're proposing to test in the field. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Item seven, contract extension with Passport Labs. Our presenter, who I believe is online, is Justin Ray. Yes, I am. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So um, I'm here, or oh, good afternoon. I'm here for Parking Services on behalf of Louise Garcia. So the item before you is a contract extension for Passport Labs, Inc. It's until December 31st, 2022, and it's for 25,000. Uh, we thought we'd have a new contract to bring forward to you. 
However, uh, Passport is unable to partner with the city until 2024 at the earliest. So this just extends their current contract and it allows us to pay for services rendered until the end of the year. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Wright. Item eight. You're welcome. Item eight is known as connecting housing to infrastructure program grant for improvements related to the Liberty Park Terrace apartments. Our presenter this afternoon is Marcia Davis. Good afternoon, Council. The CHIP grant, um, the city applied for and was awarded for the Liberty, Liberty Park Terrace Phase Two apartments. This grant is $680,000 dollar grant is to pay for um, utility improvements needed for this uh, housing, the low income housing. Um, this will be done as reimbursement. The city will receive the money and the um, developer will be reimbursed uh, after as construction goes on. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Item nine is a collective bargaining agreement with the Spokane Police Guild for wages and benefits for 2022. This was briefed during finance and administration earlier today and our presenter, Interim Human Resources Director and Deputy City Attorney, Mike Piccolo. Good afternoon, Council. As Mr. Perkins mentioned, this was briefed uh, a couple weeks ago to the Council Committee. It is a one-year collective bargaining agreement with the Police Guild. As the council will recall, you approved a more extensive long-term CBA last year, but that four or five year CBA has already expired because we were four or five year delinquent in getting that finalized. So that long-term one has expired. So this is a one year uh, collective bargaining agreement addressing wages, uh, which are set forth in the agreement. It is retroactive to January 1st, 2022. And we have police leadership here. If you have any follow-up questions, at the conclusion, at the, at the approval of this CBA, the parties recognize that they have to go into negotiation almost immediately to start working on a more permanent long-term four or five year CBA. Just a process question. Uh, the last time we voted on the guild contract, it was on our legislative agenda. And I'm trying to remember, did we elevate it to the legislative agenda? Is there a reason why this one is only on consent and not legislative? I am not sure why it would be on the legislative agenda. Usually it's on the consent agenda, on the, on the brief contract section. It will be carried over with your new procedure to the evening session. I don't think we were taking testimony on consent items back then. And my recollection is that you all chose to elevate it to the legislative that, session in order to take testimony on it. Okay, that would make sense. Yeah, I was gonna. I was thinking about this today. So yeah, people can testify on it because it's consent. Yeah. And also, if there is not unanimity, it can be taken separately sure. at yep. then. But no additional testimony. It'll still be anyone who wants to testify anything consent will do it at once. Okay. And before I forget, uh, for this one and the local twenty nine CBA, there will need to be a motion to update yeah. the versions that are in the council packet. Uh, Mr. John Henry what? has been working diligently to fine-tune uh, fine yeah. every last detail of those very long, lengthy agreements, and I think the last version came in this afternoon, so. Yeah, why don't we do the police one now before you move to fire? So you so probably would have seen that uh, substitution that was circulated, and it's been moved to substitute. Second. Okay, any discussion on the substitution? Hearing none, all those in favor of substituting, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Uh, any abstentions? All right, the police guild contract is substituted. The number 10 is the CBA with Local 29, which was briefed to the council uh, earlier this afternoon. It is a five-year uh, CBA from 2020 to 2024. Uh, if there are any questions on that one, fire leadership is also here. Is there a motion to uh, accept the substitution of this one that was also circulated today? So moved. Second. Okay. Moved and second. Any discussion on the substitution? All those in favor of substitution indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right. That is substituted. 
Any other questions on the fire? Yeah. I don't have so much uh, uh, a question, but um, this actually uh, might be more appropriate later as I'm thinking through it in my head. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Piccolo. Okay, thank for you. For both those items. Item 11 A, B, and C on the consent agenda reports of the mayor of pending claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library. And item 12, the city council meeting minutes. Both items will be considered during this evening's legislative session. Special budget ordinances under the forfeitures and contributions fund. And uh, council president, you yep. may have something to say here, so I'll stop right there. Yep, no, so this has been briefed fully and um, council member Kinnear has a request that we defer it for one week till next Monday when she's back. So I'm open to a motion. To I'll move. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? Okay, that's deferred for a week. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, the next series of special budget ordinances deal with various elements of the court system. One, the therapeutic court program. Two, the testing treatment and FDA reduction programs. Three is the replace and or repair various court spaces and furnishings. And finally, to add two community justice counselor positions and one community justice specialist position to formalize the pretrial services unit. And our presenter is Howard Delaney. Not seeing him. These were all briefed at public safety. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just, <clears throat> I guess I was going to ask Howard about some of this. I, in in his um, briefing on this, I mean, there's so much of this that was not discussed or brought up, and and I'm a little, I guess, confused as to how it really is going to advance various things they're trying to do. I mean, we're talking about furniture. We're talking about advertising we're talking about office supplies i mean none of this was discussed that i can recall in the briefings um and it's a lot of nickel and dime stuff but it's still it adds up and i'm just I, like it talks about the need to appropriately fund essential testing treatment and fta reduction programs but then the pieces are we're going to increase appropriation for office furniture increase appropriation for building repairs what does that have to do with testing i'm i'm completely confused on that so i just have questions for howard um in lieu of that, I'm, I'm just, I'm not really not supportive of most of these without getting some more details. All right, well, let's see if we can track them down for the, let's, let's mention all of them so we can say, but we'll see if we can track them down before then okay. maybe he can present at the, at the legislative session. That'd be great. So you just want to read the other ones? And sure, we'll I will. Any ones that he would I be will, briefing? I will take them from the top. Yeah. So the first special budget ordinance uh, arises out from the need to appropriately fund the court's therapeutic court program as provided in the Spokane Municipal Code. The next special budget ordinance is an action arising from the need to appropriately fund essential testing treatment and FTA reduction programs. The third special budget ordinance is an action arising from the need to refurbish, replace, and or repair various court spaces and furnishings. And finally, out of the Public Safety Personnel Fund, a special budget ordinance to create two community justice counselor positions and one community justice specialist to essentially formalize the pretrial services unit. All right. Moving then to resolutions and final reading ordinances. Our first one is requiring the city's planning department to publish and present an annual report for three years of accessory dwelling units, also known as ADUs. And I have listed as the presenter. Council Member Zappel. Yeah, this is uh, pretty straightforward, just uh, getting annual updates about ADUs after our changes. Thank you, sir. Our next resolution is, uh, I'm very excited about this, personally given my background in the waste business, is the appointment of Richard Hughes as Solid Waste Collection Manager, and our presenter is Chris Avery. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, today I'm seeking approval for the appointment of Rick Hughes for solid waste collection manager. Rick has extensive experience in solid waste, route management, and fleet operations that I believe would make him an excellent fit for this position. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about Rick's qualifications. 
Thank you. Mr. Avery, I can add, I want to really thank you for your support in this process and acknowledge uh, this is a promotion internal and I'm very excited about as a city administrator to promote our staff. Mr. Hughes, as, a, as Chris mentioned, extensive background in solid waste and recycling collection. And this is just, I'm just proud of the fact that we're promoting someone internal for this position. Yeah, Rick's been a pleasure to work with in past roles and I <coughs> am excited to work with him in this role as well, so. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, our next resolution is setting a hearing before the city council for September 19th for the vacation of the alley between Everett Avenue and vacated Sanson Avenue. <clears throat> Our presenter again is Mr. Eldon Brown. <clears throat> Good afternoon again. This alley is in the northeast part of town. We're just setting a hearing for September 19th. As you can see, it's been vacated on both sides already. This is an alley that was platted back in the 1900s, so it does fit within the non-user statute, which it had to be platted between 1890 and 1904, and had not be open for a period of five years, which as near as we can tell that happened. It also had to be in the county for a period of five years before the city annexes it, and it was annexed in 1907, so it fits all the criteria to be vacated as part of the non-user statute, which we don't require any payment for that particular situation. We have no city utilities in there, but Avista does want to maintain an easement for the west 130 feet. They have a facility in there that they want to have maintenance to. Other than that, we'd recommend approval subject to conditions. Anybody have any questions? Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Brown. And our final item for the advanced briefing for Monday, August 15. H1A, hearing expressing intention of the City Council to designate multifamily tax exemption target areas. And H1B, the final reading related to multiple family housing property tax exemptions. Our presenter is Terry Stripes. I can read this as well. Mr. So the, Mike Piccolo. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. Uh, so the Terry has been working with the Council on updating the MFT MFTE ordinance to reflect the many changes from the state legislature, and also to increase the boundary, make changes to the boundary under a different format. So it's a two-step process. One is to pass a resolution setting, uh, declaring the Council's intention to. Uh, change the boundary which will be published and then to also amend the ordinance the amendments are quite extensive I think the council has been briefed in committee uh, on, on those extensive changes um, and Terry has been a great lead on making these updates thank you mr. piccolo all right we now will return to the four special budget ordinance ordinance items for our court system as I believe Mr. Howard Delaney is now on the line, and there he is. Mr. Delaney. I am. Thank you very much, Mr. Perkins. Uh, sorry, Council. Uh, I saw them on the legislative agenda for tonight, and I missed the fact they were briefing this afternoon as Council meeting was canceled last week. Again, my apologies. We're looking here at four SBOs, three of which essentially take salary savings from various positions uh, that we've had vacant for various civil service reasons over this year and apply them to uh, both uh, FTA and program uh, costs, including paying for uh, drug tests, uh, uh, evaluations, things like this. The next set uh, takes money from salary savings and applies them to uh, rehabbing the courtrooms, again, as I mentioned in the uh, briefing at the committee level, uh, nothing has been done with our courtrooms in terms of paint or anything uh, since 2010, and this allows us to do cleaning and fix-up uh, for those facilities and a uh, little work um, in our uh, main facility in the Public Safety Building, as well as purchase furnishings. The final one of the SBOs 
takes the pretrial services unit pilot and takes it from a project special funded status and makes it endemic in our budget, converting the employees to FTEs. Uh, when we started the project, we were fully staffed. Uh, a couple people left for permanent positions and frankly, we're just unable to fill anything on the project level uh, at this point uh, due to uh, national employment reasons that everybody is struggling to hire, and I think all departments in the city. So again, no real impact on the general fund, um, reallocating money that was previously allocated uh, to both clean up the physical facilities issues and furnishings we have to uh, fund various uh, programs, and again, including Uber rides, pretrial release uh, issues, uh, drug testing, et cetera, and then the third in the series, or the fourth in the series, uh, to make the PSU unit endemic. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them for council. Um, Howard, a couple of clarifications on the, on the first one, 251. It says 55,000 professional services. Can you tell us what type of professional services yeah. those are? Drug testing. Okay. And then... Uh, it, sorry. No, yep, yeah, go ahead. And uh, have, ADP is who we use, and those are built under our professional services line. Okay. And then in the 252, it says professional services and then contractual services. Can you... Tell us what those uh, are. Yes, uh, those are for uh, assessments and the professional services. I believe uh, we tagged in some uh, medically assisted treatment money, and that's related to a uh, physician. Okay. All right. Thanks. As I recall. I don't, Council Member Cathcart might have some yeah. questions for you. So registration schooling, who are we sending to school? Um, actually, uh, registration and schooling is generic. And that uh, is what we use for uh, uh, continuing education for our staff uh, to receive training, as well as our bench. Uh, those would include national training, such as uh, National Association of Drug Court Professionals and uh, other training events within Washington State. That all falls under the generic heading of schooling. And then what are we advertising for $2,200 and what's the difference between office supplies and operating supplies? Uh, the office, the advertising uh, budget is across all the therapeutic courts and it's really uh, promotional materials, uh, pamphlets, brochures, and publication as well as the program notebooks uh, that falls into the operational supplies. Uh, so it's, it's all the promo materials we use for the court, again, including uh, handouts, brochures, et cetera, goes in advertising. And then the uh, operational supplies are things like notebooks, program materials that we have to buy from either repro graphics or outside, and then operating supplies or uh, office supplies are literally uh, – Pens, you know, pens, pencils, uh, paper that we have to buy for the copiers, and, and everything that's really not an operational supply, like a program booklet or material that we have to buy. And then lastly for me, uh, uh, can you just kind of discuss a little bit about what, what furniture we're, we're buying for 50000 and then building repairs maintenance. Is that on the courthouse building or is that a different building? Uh, the, that's on our current courtrooms in the public safety, or sorry, in the courthouse annex. Uh, those four courtrooms, again, have n never been painted uh, or upgraded in any sense, and it's a complete patch and paint for all of those, including uh, some additional work on the therapeutic court coordinator's office who's had a hole in the ceiling forever that they just got patched, and it's scheduled for uh, to patch in all that stuff to uh, put the sheetrock tape on it and actually paint it County Rainier white. 
the furniture we're buying, uh, we have been using county furniture for the last decade. Um, it's now, it, it was dilapidated. Uh, we purchased some discount chairs three years ago. Uh, literally, the arms are breaking off and uh, falling on the floor. The gas pistons for the council chairs in the courtroom don't work. The stand-up desks no longer work. So this is to replace uh, the courtroom furniture with new uh, commercial grade tables and chairs, et cetera. And then my, my last question, was this discussed or considered prior to setting the last budget or was this a new kind of thing that had to come about recently? Uh, the, 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 the chairs and the furniture really degraded badly after we came back from pandemic and started putting people full-time back in the courtrooms. Um, and uh, last year, uh, it was, uh, we were limited in, of course, what we could ask for. Uh, we were looking for flatline budgets. So when we ended up with all these salary savings without asking for additional appropriation for the general fund, it made sense to us to use existing salary savings to do a bunch of these things that we had not been able to do for years in order to, you know, get us up to some sort of standard of appearance and function within the courtrooms and the other offices. I think we're also buying several chairs for the front counter. Uh, the, they're old, stained, the gas pistons don't work in them, and it's just old. Okay. So, yes, we considered asking for such things in the last budget, but there just wasn't going to be room. And when we ended up not being able to hire all these people, it seemed like a sensible allocation of the salary savings without having to go back and ask for additional general fund allocations. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Howard? All right. Thank you so much, Howard, for being thank with you. us. Thank you. I think that's Would all Would you like need. me to also be in attendance at 6, I Council President? I'm happy to. I don't, I don't see anyone nodding, so no. Okay. Thank um, you very much. All right. Thank you. That brings us to the end of uh, the agenda for August 15th. Is there a motion to approve it? So, uh, oh. so, sorry, Brian, we do have someone up for a boards and commissions appointment to the C tab that Shauna and I are requesting we defer for two weeks. We have not been able to get them in for an interview yet. Okay. And who's that? Jordan Kahn. Okay. So that just means for the C tab, we won't do that one. Yep. Do you, well, we can just, do we need to vote to remove it? I don't know. Um, is there a motion to uh, table the CTAB appointment indefinitely? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right. That's deferred indefinitely. But the CHHS, well, we're ready for all yep. those three. All right. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right. The agenda is approved. We're going to go into executive session to discuss litigation matters. And, Lyndon, what do we, 15 minutes or? About 15 minutes. Okay. Let's say... to uh, 4.50 by my watch. And we, we don't anticipate uh, undertaking any business upon our return, but I will come back either at, at 4.50 to extend or to adjourn the meeting. Thank you.
All right, this is Council President Brian Beggs, and we have finished our executive session, and our meeting is adjourned. Thanks for using WebEx. Visit our website at www.com.